point of the scene with the Reverend was not to introduce a buddy character, but to foreshadow the endless quest to vanquish evil and the way it will consume Loomis. Fair enough, but uh, I gotta review Halloween 5. Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the Night Personality with the Best Hair, and welcome back to. The Summer of Halloween! And today we are going to be looking at the second movie in the Halloween franchise made without the help of John Carpenter. Made one year after the fourth, Halloween 5 The Revenge of Michael Myers. Well, what's the point of bringing back an 80s horror icon during the 80s if you're not going to squeeze as much out of him as you can while the 80s are still around? The Revenge of Michael Myers takes place right where the return of Michael Myers leaves off. If you ignore the ending, rework it a tad and keep Myers as the one and only bad guy of the series. Both Donald Pleasance and Danielle Harris weren't exactly happy with that decision. Halloween 4 ended with Jamie definitively evil, and it would make more sense for her to come back as the new villain or maybe a sidekick character to Michael Myers, but instead she gets psychic powers! In an attempt to mix things up, the filmmakers mixed up Halloween in much the same way that both the Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th franchises had already been mixed up. The psychic girl who is the key to battling the slasher villain. Thus, the revenge of Michael Myers consists of him surviving that night in Haddonfield, waiting a year, and coming back for more the next Halloween. But this time, his moves are picked up by the handy-dandy psychic girl, and Dr. Loomis aims to use this power to try to stop him once and for all. I think a psychic would be able to tell him such a thing is pointless, but anyway, let's take a look at Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, and see just why you can't kill what you can't consistently write. After we watch a pumpkin be viciously mutilated before our very eyes, we suddenly teleport back to the ending of Halloween 4, so the movie can really quickly try to explain how exactly Michael Myers survived being shot far, far more than six times. Because he survived! That wasn't a sinkhole he fell into, it was a random mineshaft! Even though in this version of events, the townspeople try to BLOW HIM THE FUCK UP! But oh no, he narrowly escapes that, which would likely also not kill him, and slips into the waterway, escaping the police and slipping downstream into the night. Barely escaping the current with the help of his safety harness, Michael eventually finds his way to an old shack in the woods. <laughs> I... I think. I, it's not exactly the most coherent editing there. So this strange masked man just tried to kill the hermit, but that's no reason he can't spend a year nursing him back to health. This brings the story to 1989, and the children's clinic in Haddonfield where Jamie is also remembering the ending of Halloween 4, with extra scenes added to it. <laughs> You know, the uh, wake up screaming at the camera usually works better when the camera is angled, you know, directly in front of the guy, not to the side, but also it helps if the screaming is audible too. But there's good reason she's at the clinic. It seems much like Michael after he killed his sister, Jamie hasn't been able to talk since attacking her foster mother. Yeah, just attacking. Jamie's a good girl, so no successful murders in her history anymore. However, her nightmare isn't over yet. She might be awake, but suddenly she gets visions of the terrifying acts Uncle Mike is doing at this very moment. Ah, the psychic girl slasher movie, where so often they mix up the kills in a brand new way by just splicing in images of a convulsing girl in the middle of all of them. <laughs> Doesn't get annoying at all. They quickly pull her out of there, leaving behind the note she scrawled on the chalkboard about how Michael Myers is coming back for her, and the doctors rush to save her life. But what's this? Dr. Loomis appears telling them not to administer treatment, because she'll be fine. You see? I see you still want this girl dead. She has something to tell us. Something that's probably not very important. Let's ignore that chalkboard from earlier and... In fact, forget it ever existed. The next morning, Rachel is here to see Jamie, still played by Ellie Cornell, and soon enough, two more faces show up. Tina Williams, played by Wendy Foxworth, and Max the doggy butt. Here we learn two important things. First of all, Jamie doesn't even remember that time she tried to stab her foster mother to death. I mean, it was so inconsequential. Who could blame her? 
Second, dogs are very much not allowed in this clinic, because hospitalized children must avoid any and all things that bring happiness as part of their treatment, as it seems when Dr. Loomis comes in and has Tina take Max out of there right away. Of course, he's still pretty kind compared to some other people. But if the other movies are anything to go by, vandalism is just how you express yourself in Haddonfield. Such as this brick with a note on it, kindly informing the hospital staff that they should probably think about killing Jamie at some point. Ah, well, Jamie's not doing well, and the town is crawling to people who would really like to see her dead, but... Eh, she should be fine. Besides, Tina informs Rachel of a bitchin' Halloween party going on that she should totally check out. Max, however, tries to warn her about the strange figure sneaking around the bushes. She doesn't listen, of course, but Jamie's psychic powers kick in. Knowing that something is going on with Max, they call Rachel and beg the woman to go and make sure the dog is all right! D come on, movie, I don't give a damn if Myers gets Rachel or not. Is Max okay? He's fine. Oh, and Rachel was not absolutely murdered by Michael Myers. He's back to doing his stalky bit again. Ah oh, well, while nothing seems to have come of that yet, Dr. Loomis figures he might be able to get some important information out of the handy-dandy psychic girl nonetheless. Tell me what you know! You right, right, right! For God's sakes, Jamie! What in the hell are the Powerball numbers?! She doesn't say anything, but probably should have, considering we're back to watching Rachel around the house, and yeah, Michael's still kicking around in the background. What Rachel notices, though, is some strange sounds leading her to find a picture of Jamie that has been shattered. No! <laughs> Much like Rachel's hopes of ever appearing in Halloween 6. It's too late to help Rachel now, which is just as well as doctors are more concerned with keeping Jamie alive than figuring out what she's trying to say. Loomis, though, figures that Michael Myers must have returned for revenge. With that in mind, he meets back up with Sheriff Meeker, played again by Bo Starr. Yeah, that's how you pronounce it, I'm told. Either way, Loomis refreshes Meeker on just who Myers is. My memory goes back 12 years. 12 years back from 1989, back in 1977 when Michael Myers... Well, he was confined to his room. It's a pretty good year, come to think of it. His story about how the other movies went just leaves a meager being told to get to work. But then we get to see Tina. She's heading over to Rachel's place, but funny thing, can't seem to find Rachel anywhere. How strange. <laughs> You know, just thinking, if in horror movies, friends always just sneak up on you and scare the crap out of you at random, wouldn't that make the slasher villains the friendliest people in town? This would be Samantha, played by Tamara Glynn. She's here to meet up with Tina and Rachel to go to that big party. But with Rachel suddenly missing, they both assume she just said fuck it and headed up to the country with her parents. I mean, it's either that or... Oh, come on, Tina, you can clearly see him badly sneaking off to the side there. I guess his Batman powers are a little rusty this time around. Ah, eh, no bother. They have more pressing matters to worry about, such as Samantha's new love interest, and of course, Tina's boyfriend, Michael. Michael! What? Okay, that's how I'm going to talk to fans on the street from now on. Hey, Decker! What? Michael, or Mikey if you want to have an easier time telling them apart, is a leather jacket wearing muscle car driving rebel, played by Jonathan Chapin. That's all well and good, but Myers is also tormenting Jamie and motherfucking person. This is a bit early to kill her and end the movie, though, so her further stalkers turn out to be nothing more than hospital staff worried about her. And even better, she refuses to tell. Or, I guess, sign to Loomis about anything about what's going on, which understandably frustrates the man. There's a reason why he has this power over you. Did you ever wonder what it is? It's the psychic girl cliché. Wasn't really a cliché before, but considering this came out after A Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th both did the same shit, you can't really be seen as not jumping on the bandwagon here. The big takeaway here, though, is there's still, like, an hour of movie left, so Dr. Loomis heads to the old Myers house, which looks like in between movies he got both renovated and dilapidated, in order to examine the inside. Establishing there is a laundry chute, and thus it will be very important later, we then see something that is actually mysterious. Black 
sneaking in the shadows with a thorn rune tattooed on his wrist. Don't ask about the Cult of Thorn, though. That wasn't actually hammered out until Halloween 6. Here, this guy just shows up and goes around doing spooky, mysterious shit that they didn't explain because they didn't even know what it was in the first place they were writing. Ooh. The laundry chute, on the other hand, does get fully fleshed out, explaining that it goes to the basement and has something inside. Oh, oh, nothing brings me joy quite like a surprise cadaver. On that note, Tina, Samantha, and Mikey go to the store to meet up with Samantha's squeeze, Spitz, played by Matthew Walker, and to acquire a few cases of beer, as Spitz tells Mikey he can slip him three cases, but any more and the boss will probably notice. So he heads around back to pick up the goods. However, while Mikey's there, he runs into Michael, who is practicing new ways to horrify his victims. Well, I guess that does mix things up for horror spooks. What's he gonna do next? Unfortunately, when Mikey confronts Michael over this, the killer stabs him through the skull with the garden claw, killing him! As we've established plenty of times before this, Michael's a natural behind the wheel and actually drives over to Tina's place to pick her up and bring the both of them down to that party. How can't she tell that Michael's not Michael, though? I just love barbaric men. Because he's wearing a mask. <laughs> and to be honest, her boyfriend was always kind of an asshole anyway. With Tina being so close to the man, of course, that means that Jamie begins to have terrifying psychic convulsions. She knows Tina is in danger, and the feeling is so powerful. Store. Store. She regains the ability to speak, much faster than Michael. Either that, or he's actually always kind of been able to speak, but he knows. Unless your name is Freddy Krueger, just don't. It's not exactly an on-off switch, though, as her broken speech is kind of hard to interpret. Fortunately, Cookie Woman has all the information they need to know exactly what gas station she's at and send help on the way. Tina Williams, if you are Tina Williams, stay where you are. Ah, damn, Haddonfield don't fuck around when it comes to littering. Thanks to this lightning-fast and well-choreographed police response, Tina is saved! Against her will, but it still counts. Unfortunately, there's only so much one can do to save someone from themselves, as she just doesn't get the idea of her not going to the party to stay where it's safe for tonight, just based on the word of this handy-dandy psychic girl here. But he was with you. Who? The boogeyman. Oh yeah, that's one way of describing him. Oh, come on, the last movie already established that like everyone in town knows Michael Myers as the boogeyman, a sort of shorthand. She can't really tell you it was Michael that you were with, because I'm pretty sure your dumbass would think she's talking about Mikey. So Jamie might be screaming and crying and begging Tina not to go, but fuck that noise. She has underage drinking and teenage fucking to do. Therefore, she easily leaves the place and heads down to the party anyway. Lewis thinks this is a bad idea, so the police decide to send down the two comic relief cops. Arguably an even worse idea. Follow her then. At least she can do that. If that girl dies tonight. All right, all right. For you, Doc, anything. Daddy's Nick and Tom played by Frankie Como and David Urson. They were introduced back when Rachel had to find Max. I can't believe I forgot to bring that up. All clear. Nothing above, nothing below. Uh, what about Max? Adobe, right? Oh. Yeah, that music was just... there. Because every time I've been running around outside searching for a lost pet, it's always such a happy-go-lucky fun time! Since that point, the pair did just about fuck all, but now they have to keep track of Tina in an attempt to keep those titties intact. Jamie, however, doesn't trust the comic relief to be able to lend any assistance, and follows her as well, along with a friend from the clinic, Billy Hill, played by Jeffrey Landman. Eventually, Tina reaches the party, and meeting up with Samantha and Spitz, they decide to have a little fun. Take me, but spare my friend! She's a virgin. Got her phone number? <laughs> you think that's funny? Well, it's not. 
Trust me, we're the comic relief. We know funny. Yeah, we got the happy-go-lucky jingle and everything. This is just your run-of-the-mill Michael Myers costume being worn by Spitz. Kind of a missed opportunity that Mikey didn't dress up as Michael, if you ask me, but either way, Samantha finds a kitten, which is far more important than that whole taunting police thing, and the three of them run off into the barn in search of more kittens. However, Tina finds something far less cute and cuddly. <laughs> Well, at the very least, he didn't hit her with a pun like, Hey! Tina decides cute, cuddly kittens aren't worth this kind of bullshit, leaving Samantha and Spitz all by themselves. Or Samantha by herself. As who is this strange masked man coming up to her? Spitz! Oh my god! <laughs> Spitz, again. Yeah, the horror of this movie is that man running this joke into the ground. As much as of an insufferable dick as he is, the man is a dick, and that just so happens to be exactly what Samantha needs right now. As he, um, awkwardly fumbles around and smells her. Are they having sex? Oh, um, guess so. Well, then it's time for the slasher villain to show up and put a stop to this! <laughs> Kind of a shame Michael missed the opportunity to do the two-for-one deal here. All that downtime in between movies must be making him rusty. Not to say Samantha manages to get away, though. Myers takes this Grim Reaper shit to the next level on her ass! That sounded different. Yeah, <laughs> we never did stuff like that when we were a kid. No, we were normal. Butt plugs, nipple clamps, and the cat of nine tails. You saying that, that don't make you scream? That's what the ball gag's for. They don't bother to get up to check, though, because they see that zany hooligan Spitz coming over to say hi. We don't see what happens to them yet, though. First, the party has to just suddenly end, because when the house is full of drunk and high teenagers who desperately want to fuck, obviously they're all going to hop in their eyes at the same time to get the fuck out of there. As the party's over, Tina heads back to the barn to get back with her friends. However, finding only bloody kittens and dead bodies instead, she runs to the police. Please help me. Yeah, and you're all looking a bit vampish there, Tina, so you might want to get the fuck out of there before anyone comes and finds you and gets the wrong idea. Someone like Jamie and Billy, and who Tina at first believes to be that asshole Michael, but as it turns out is actually that murderer Michael. Thus they must run! Off into the woods, which, considering Michael is pursuing them in a car, is actually not a bad strategy. Yeah, that's built for tough, all right. Of course, Michael Myers is somewhere between Wolverine and the motherfucking Terminator, so... Then, what's the end result of Jamie running all the way down there and luring Myers into a fiery explosion that would have killed anyone else in the world outside of Dr. Loomis, all in the hopes of saving Tina's life? Go made all of those efforts about as useful as a change.org petition to try and find a cure for Ligma. Tina's sacrifice has some results, though, as the children manage to slip away long enough for their good friend Dr. Loomis to sneak up on them and scare the crap out of them in the middle of the night in a dark forest. So the children are safe. At least for now. Loomis has a plan, though. He's not an action hero. He's a psychiatrist, using his powers of therapy. He tries to connect with Michael Myers once more, promising him a way to quell his rage. You have to fight it in the place where it's strongest. Where it all began! The safe way, where you asked your mother for that candy bar, but she refused to buy it for you. The tantrum must end, Michael! You have to let it go! Or Loomis means Michael's old home. And they established it earlier, and despite how different it looks, they do an okay job of trying to recreate the scene of Meyer's sister up alone in her room with Jamie, our good old bait for this trap. If you do that good and loud, I'll be out of here in a flash. Running right the fuck down the street and away from here. You can deal with Myers on your own, bitch. But what's this? Jamie's psychic powers show that Michael is not coming for her, but rather attacking the clinic. With this revelation, just about all the police force leaves Jamie's ass behind to go save the other, less important children. 
Deputy Charlie, played by Troy Evans, figures this sting is a bust, so he'll just take Jamie back down to the station. But Loomis is having none of that. He's sure Michael will come here anyway. Right on cue, Charlie gets a call from Eddie about how one of their cars just so happened to come back around. Eddie, can you read me? Over it. Knowing Michael is coming, they get ready. However, the trap to kill Michael isn't entirely Loomis's plan. He first wants to spend a little time reasoning with the psychopath superhuman mass murderer. After all, Jamie can help him. She can stop the rage. The rage inside. But I like rage. And rage too looks fucking awesome. Obviously, diplomacy has failed. Myers attacks Loomis, beating him bloody, while Charlie tries his best to get Jamie to safety. Oh, what the fuck's the guy supposed to do when Michael's got the power of shoddy editing on his side? Sorry, Charlie. With him out of the way, Michael has no one left to get in the way of murdering Jamie. But what's this? Jamie has found that handy-dandy laundry chute he randomly established earlier! Hiding in it isn't quite as effective as she hoped, though, as Michael finds her very quickly and tries to grab her. <laughs> Thanks for closing the shoot door there, Loomis. I'm half expecting to see blood start oozing out of the cracks now. Such drops are only mild injuries for Jamie, though. Which shouldn't be too surprising, considering when Michael comes to the basement to try and take her out, the threat of being stabbed to death is enough to get her to climb right the fuck back up the thing, even after getting stabbed in the leg. Heading upstairs, she finds that Michael has prepared another one of his artistic dioramas, made out of fresh victims. <laughs> Those two assholes! Michael killed the damn dog! Again! How many times are I gonna have to tell you, Michael? Jesus Christ! Just having that low-quality, plushy fucking dog to represent the corpse doesn't make this any better, you know! Of course, Myers is coming, too. So Jamie hops in the coffin. Not my first thought for getting prepared, but alright. She, however, tries having a heart-to-heart -heart with the guy. And stranger still, it actually fucking works. At least for a little while before Michael remembers, Wait, just one fucking minute! I'm the slasher villain and this is the climax! I must try to kill this child, but be suddenly terrible at it. Not to worry, Dr. Lewis is here to help. You want her! Here she is! He's yours! To help the bad guy. I know they say if you can't beat him, join him, but that's taking it a bit far, don't you think? Well, when Loomis continues to tell Michael to come and kill Jamie, all while slowly backing away from the man, it becomes a little obvious that he's actually using her as bait to lure him into a trap. Obvious to everyone but Michael, luckily enough, as the man is captured in a chain net. With him helpless, Loomis administers some therapeutic 2x4 beating so vicious, he did actually break Don Shank's nose. This has to be the weirdest and most convoluted opening to a porno I've ever seen. Never mind that fuckery spooky ending! Michael Myers has been arrested, and has been placed in a prison cell, safely away from those he wishes to murder. But what's this? That man in black that peeks in and out of scenes every now and again with no explanation as to why? Well, he's back, and with the power of a smoke machine, releases Michael from his binds, who then kills every last one of them, wrecking the police station, and even setting metal bars themselves on fire. The end. Yet somehow, with all that murdering and rampaging going on, he still managed to miss Jamie on the way out. He's really not very good at this. Anyway. That was Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. And... Wow. Not terrible, but there's certainly a lot of room for improvement here. The idea to mix it up a bit was a good one, as the previous movie was so very murder by number, but still, mistakes were made. Jamie turning evil only to turn around and not be evil next movie really wasn't the best move. It doesn't help that not only did Daniel and Donald think abandoning that direction was a bad idea, but the movie itself still shows the ending of Halloween 4, and in greater detail. Tommy Jarvis was built up as being the next Jason Voorhees, but when they scrapped that, the writers made him a mentally scarred character with inner demons. 
Jamie just goes from mommy stabby psycho murder mode to happy kid with psychic powers. It's not nearly as natural of a transition. Quite especially considering it was established quite clearly, it was most certainly not all just a dream, but I've ranted on that one topic long enough. The rest of the characters are, uh, eh? Rachel was built up so well in the last movie, but she was killed off as a means to show the audience no one is safe. Not even the characters that would be entertaining to watch, so please enjoy this assortment of forgettable teenage assholes plus the comic relief cops. Yay. Then there's the man in black, the mysterious character that... Well, there really was no mystery to unravel. The writers at the time literally didn't know what he was going to eventually be representing in the series. They just threw his ass in there to be all mysterious and shit and get audiences to talk about what it all means by themselves. Like this is a goddamn episode of Lost or some shit. Overall, Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers is at best okay. The scares are paced well enough and you get a little stalker Myers here and there. And the kills are creative. Unfortunately, annoying characters and poor writing choices hold the film back, coming in at two wax in the nose by a two by four out of five. Two wax to the four out of... well, no, two by four out of... two out of five! Okay. Thank you all for watching, I've been Echo Shadow, and remember, don't stab your mother or kill dogs. Kidnapping little girls who are psychic to use the psychic powers and lure psycho killers, bit of a gray area.